go ahead and share what we've got going on. Yeah, this is something we started here at the first of the year. We've never really done this before, but we're going to take whatever time we need, whatever the Lord wants us to do, to um, teach on how... And the youth are dismissed, by the way. David said youth are dismissed. Oh, yeah. That's Thank right. You. All youth, if you would, please go back to your meeting. But to teach on the uh, appropriation of the finished work of the cross... And we want to teach you and, and try to delve into every area that we can, the Holy Spirit shows us to, to, to show you how to have victory and to appropriate the finished work of the cross in your life. No matter whether it's healing or whether it's relationships or whether it's um, finances, it uh, doesn't make any difference. There's so many areas. So we've kind of started at ground zero back um, at the first of the year, the first Sunday of the year, uh, laying out the groundwork of the love of God for us and how much he loves us. And, and then now we've, we've gone to, about Jesus and, and his, his importance and greatness. And now we're talking about today who Jesus is in us. All right. Hallelujah. All right. So the title today is Who we are in Christ. And as we said, we Van was talking about laying the groundwork. We laid the groundwork of the love of the Father. We took two weeks for that. And then we talked about who Jesus is. And, and now we're going to talk about who then we are in Jesus. Next time we come together, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. So when you understand the Godhead and, and all that we have, and we are the fullness of the Godhead bodily, but you have to understand that foundation so that then, you know, so many people, they've heard the grace message, they've heard the, the finished work of the cross. Some people say, what do you mean by the finished work of the cross? Well, it's not just getting saved to be able to one day enter into heaven, but it's the sozo package. I mean, it's everything. It's healing. It's deliverance. It's it's victory in every area. It's it's uh, prosperity. It, all of this is encompassed in the finished work of the cross and everything that he did for us, part of the atonement package. So it's very, very important, and we want to help teach you how to live it out to where you can apply that in your life, literally, like Van said, in every single area that you walk in. Now, we don't know how long we'll be doing this. This is something very different. Um, so we, uh, but we're excited about this. So I want to start here when we're going to talk about who we are in Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21, and many of you know these verses, but we want to begin there because until you understand this, then you can't understand anything else about who you are in Christ. When it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, everything is about who we are in Christ. In fact, you can do your own study. There won't be a way today that we can do everything of who we are in Christ. There are so many scriptures, and I strongly encourage you to go into the Bible and do a study this week on in him, in whom, of whom, by whom, through him, through Christ. All of these We'll talk about who you are, and that's how you need to see yourself, not based on who you are in the flesh or who you are in your soul, but who you are in the spirit, who you are in Jesus Christ. Years ago, I did a message on the difference between Jesus being in us and us being in him. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today because there's a big difference. The Bible says in John chapter, before I get to this scripture, the Bible says in John chapter 15, verse 7, it said, if you abide in me, and he said, if, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it will be done for you. The big key is if. If you abide in me. See, what that means is you are under his wing of protection. You are under the umbrella so if you are abiding in him, and not in your soul or not in your flesh, when you're abiding in him, then you have that protection of Psalms 91. And then you can ask what you will, and it will be done for you. But if you step out from underneath that covering and you get into worry or in fear, doubt, unbelief, anger, all of these things mean you have decided, I am not going to be in him for the moment. I'm going to step out of here, and I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. But then you open yourself wide to whatever may come. And you don't want to do that. There's no protection out from underneath his umbrella of abiding in him. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and read this. Uh, 
2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now let me stop right there for a second. Old things have passed away. Everything, sickness, disease, poverty, defeat, fear, now unbelief, all of this has passed away, and everything about you has become new. You are brand new. Goes on to say in verse 18, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And look at this, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He's not, he is not condemning us. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Again, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are what? In Christ Jesus. Amen. So, you know, sometimes you get an unworthy spirit or, or whatever and you deal with things. Condemnation doesn't come from the Lord. It comes from the enemy and sometimes you condemn yourself. But if you just get back into abiding in Christ, then all of that thing goes by the wayside. Then old things are passed away, and behold, all things are new. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, which we talked about last time, he took everything, and it was so neat. Um, we were in uh, Orlando for the last few days. We were at the Gospel Truth Seminar, uh, Gospel Truth Conference, they call them now, that Andrew was doing. And he, he made this comment, and, and you know, this is, this is good. He said, Jesus did not come to change your life, but to exchange your life. He didn't come to change your life, but to exchange your life. See, you are no longer that old man, the old sin nature. We were born into a sin nature. We were born into a sin nature. But Jesus came through the, the he was the, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, the perfect sacrifice. And he took the old and made everything new in our lives. So that's where we have to begin because until you understand that, we could tell you all this other stuff that we're going to be talking about today, but it would mean nothing. First, you have to recognize you are not that old person anymore. And I have to do it. And as you've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer you that lives. That's my verse. You have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer you that lives, but it's Christ Jesus who lives in you. In the life which you live in your flesh, you live by the faith of the Son of God who what? Loved you and gave himself for you. Galatians 2.20. See, when you grab a hold of this understanding, he's given you his faith. You use his faith in your flesh, and when you're using his faith in this flesh, and you're abiding in him, then you can be victorious every moment of every day. That is the truth. That is the truth. All right. Um, but I just wanted to say that part. I thought that was real good. Jesus did not come to change your life, but to exchange the old man for the new man of who Jesus is. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, look, look at verse 3. Uh, 3 through 14, number 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, everybody see that word has? Who has already, who has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You have already, if you're a born again believer, you have already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. It belongs to you already. It's not going to be belonging to you. It's not coming your way. It's not when your ship comes in. 
you are, your ship has already arrived. <laughs> Sonship, daughtership, that's the kind of ship you want and what you've got. So it's not a question of in the sweet by and by. It's not a question of when I do this or how I perform for this or when, if I can just uh, muster up enough favor with God. You're eaten up with favor of the God, of the Lord. Amen. God has given you favor beyond measure. And so he has already blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. But a lot of people stop there. But it's in Christ Jesus. Without the in Christ Jesus, it's not correct at all. It's got to be in Christ Jesus. Just verse 4, just as he chose us. How many of you know you were chosen? You were hand-picked. Just as he chose us in him, we're chosen in him, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without uh, blame before him in love. We are holy only because he is holy. Boy, I tell you what, I get emails and stuff and God's calling, calling the body to holiness. Got to be holy. Got to get, this is the year God wants everybody to be holy. You can't be holy on your own. Yeah, that's just performing and trying. You, can't, you wouldn't last a day trying to be holy, and I wouldn't last a day. But we are holy in him. We are holy. Why? Because he is holy. Amen? Having, verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Now, I tell people all the time that when I minister to them, or Regina and I minister to people one-on-one, -on -one, quit trying to be accepted. Quit looking for your acceptance from man, trying to make, you know, please man. And, and the, because the fear of man is a snare, the Bible says. It's a, it's a trap that you try to please man. It doesn't mean that we don't do our best or we don't have an excellent spirit. Yes, we do. We have a spirit of excellence, like what, what God told Daniel. We're supposed to have that. But we are accepted already in the beloved in Christ Jesus. Already accepted. Don't have to jump through any hoops. Don't have to wake up and, and uh, today, today I'm going to make it. I know I feel like I fell short yesterday. But today, you know, that the enemy will lie to you through your feelings, through your soulish realm. That's why we don't live life through our feelings. Amen. We live life through the Word of God. And what the Word of God says about you is who you are. Not what people say you are or what, what some well-meaning Christian tries to convince you are. It's who, what the Word says Amen. about you. That is your identity. Amen? Amen? Okay, so it said, According to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of God, by which He has us, uh, made us accepted already in the Beloved. And in Him we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. There we go again. Which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. Well, you never know what God's going to do. We just have to try to figure out his will. He's, he's God and we're not. What does that say right there? He made a, to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us Amen. the mystery of his will. It might be a mystery to those outside of the body of Christ, but it doesn't need to be a mystery to us in the body. Amen. According to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in time he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him and we're going to beat that dead horse to death in Christ in him in Christ in him when you quote, quote scripture all these scriptures remember in Christ in him because outside of Christ we're nothing inside of Christ we can do all things and everything he has is at our disposal because we belong to him in Christ in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated uh, 
predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We have been sealed already with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So bottom line, y'all, it says in Acts 17, 28, for in him we literally move. We live and move and have our very being. Yes. That's it. In him we have everything. We literally live and move and have our very being. And that's where the victory is 100% of the time. You know, in uh, Colossians verse, chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, we're talking about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we began with the Father, and we t talked about the Son, and we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit. Who, n next, we'll be, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, who he is, and then we're going to be talking about the gifts of the Spirit before we enter into what we have next which will be entering into his rest. We've got this, it is so neat that the Lord is laying this all out. And when you get that foundation, you know, it's like we were talking about the house that was built on the sand. In the first storm that comes along, it's going to fall flat. But when you build on the foundation of the Godhead bodily, and you know you are complete in him, when it says here, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. No matter what's going on out there, whatever the devil might try to do, he's already a defeated foe, and you are the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete already in him. You are already complete. Yes. Now, girls, it doesn't mean that you're going to wait till one day, oh, one day, I'm going to meet my better half, and then I'll be so complete. No, you better be complete before you meet him. And he's not going to be your other half. It is 100% here and 100% here. He's complete. I'm complete. And you can't ever have your spouse be to you what only God can do for you. Amen. That was never intended. That was never intended. You have to be complete in the Lord. That's where your fullness comes from. That's where your peace comes from. That's where your joy comes from. I give Van 100% of who I am in Christ. And he gives me 100% of who he is in Christ. And we've been doing this for a very long time. Next month, we'll have our 39th wedding anniversary. And I, I'm telling you, it works because I never expected Van to complete me. That's not his job. You are complete in Christ. In him, you are complete. And you have all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, which means you have everything. There is nothing you lack when you understand your completion is in Jesus. In Jesus. Right? Yes. So, moving on, it says here, in, in, uh, and this is really good too, in 1 Corinthians 6.17. 1 Corinthians 6.17 says, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. See, he took that old sin nature. He gave us who he is. It's no longer we that are living, but it's he that's living in us, and we are one spirit. Man, if that doesn't set your fire, that's not how I should say it. How do you say that? If that doesn't light your fire, your wood is wet. There you go. Amen. All right. Thank you, sweetheart. Anyway, so. <laughs> You're complete in him. I am. Amen. I am. But anyway, I, I, I knew I wasn't saying that exactly right. But see, I'm telling you, when you realize, when you realize that you are one spirit with him, yeah. doesn't that get you excited? Yeah. Man, that should show you there is nothing impossible to those who believe God. That's what his word said. There is nothing impossible. And when you recognize you are fully complete, 
then that takes away any insecurities, any instabilities, any unworthiness, any depression, any sickness, any disease, any poverty. It takes away all of it. Yes. And it really is this simple. Many of you say, well, it can't be that simple. Well, then it can. It's what you choose to believe. And when you believe the word and the fullness of his word, then you can have the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Hallelujah. Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 26 says, For you are all sons of God. You're all, we are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Just like you put on a coat. Have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You know, when it says there, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. That means, you know what? It doesn't matter what ethnicity we are. It doesn't matter what side of the tracks we came up on. It doesn't matter our color. It doesn't matter our background. It doesn't matter anything. If we are in Christ, we are one. Everything else is division. Everything else is the enemy trying to divide because all of us, every one of us in this room right here, I don't care what your background is or, or where you came from or your culture, anything else, we all have. If you've been born again, you have blood type J for Jesus. That's your blood type. That's who you are. That's your identity and, and nothing else. Nothing else because we are all one. And you know, that's where the power is in agreement. The unity, the oneness. The Tower of Babel is a perfect example. And it was a, it was a wrong example. Meaning it was, it was when evil was done. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit said, Hey, unless we come down and confound the language, these rascals are going to build a tower all the way to heaven. And they were evil people. But conversely, us as the body of Christ, who Jesus, have Jesus in our hearts, the Holy Spirit, and we have the, the Jesus as our Lord and Savior, if we recognize that we are one, every one of us are one in Christ Jesus, not male, not female. Yes, we know we're male and female. We know all these things. We're aware of that, but that's not our identity. Our identity is who we are in Christ Jesus. That's what holds us together. That's where the power is in that power in agreement. And it says there in that last verse, in verse 29, said, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The promise and the blessings of Abraham belong to us. Amen? That's a mighty good stuff to belong to you. So just recognize, recognize people. You know, the Bible says, no, Owe no man anything but what? But to love them. And not just with your or my puny love, but with the love of Christ. The love of God, which has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. All right. Down in, uh, let's go over to Ephesians. Just right here, Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Those who were far off have been brought near by type J blood. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to make sure. Does everybody have type J blood in here? Amen. Amen. That means we are belong to him. We are children of the most high. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Everything that the kingdom entails belongs to us already because we have been seated in heavenly places and every spiritual gift, everything, everything the kingdom has to offer has already been deposited into our born again spirits. 
Philippians chapter 4.13, as y'all know this verse, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When you begin to recognize who you are in Christ, then through that, you're a good parent. You're a good employee. You're a good neighbor. You're a good brother, sister. You're a good son, daughter. It, and you, you can do all these things through Christ. And you look to him to give you the strength. It's not your own strength. Yeah. You don't do things in your strength and in your power because that's weak. But the Bible says when I'm weak, he is strong within me. And that's the strength that we arrive from, and it's in him. And in 1 Timothy 1.14, And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. Exceedingly abundant, his grace. When he did that exchange, and he gave us everything of who he was, and he took our sin nature, and he put it on the cross. But it said he did it with his love. And then through faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus, we receive that exceeding abundance in our life in every area. 1 Corinthians 6, 15, 10. 1 Corinthians 15, 10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Let's stop there for a second. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Well, what are you? I am what I am. We're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are more than conquerors. We are able to do all things. Nothing is impossible to us, just like Regina just said. Why? Because we are who we are. It says, by the grace of God, we are. We am, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet and not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So you know what? We can labor and actually do physical labor or labor, do laboring, but it's, it's not us. It's the grace of God that is in us. It's just like when you have a job, you don't, you don't work for a paycheck. God is your provider. The grace of God is your provision. And he will work through you and the paycheck is just is symbolic. And yes, it goes into the bank, your checking account in the bank. But God, God is the one who brings the blessings. It's, he's the one that has caused us to have the power to get wealth. We can't, if we do it by the sweat of our brow, that's, there's so much sorrow involved in that. And then you got to hold on to it. And then you got to make sure you don't lose it. And you've got to make sure it doesn't collapse around it. But when you let God do this, do that kind of thing and prosper you in every area of your life, it's going to stay. It's going to stick. It's going to prosper because it comes from him. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Uh, Revelation. Verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood, his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He's made us both kings and priests. Revelations 5, 9 says, For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Do you reign through Christ Jesus? We as saints, that's what we're doing. We're reigning, not in the sweet by and by. We are to reign in the present now and now. You know, we are so blessed because we were born during the dispensation of grace. We're blessed. And I, I want us, to, we're going to take a moment and, and on the last part of our message here today, we want to talk about the value of being kings and priests. Yes. This is so important that you get this understanding. Now, again, we cannot take and do all there is, to, we can't say all there is to say about who we are in Christ. That would take forever. But we encourage you, and I say this once again, and for those that will be listening online, 
it's very important that you do a study yourself Absolutely. and look at the scriptures in him of whom by whom uh, through him in Christ all of these scriptures you can do it and you can do a chain reference and go from one to the you could take forever to study this out but we want to really focus in on the last part of our day here about kings and priests and the value of understanding this when you understand the difference in the old covenant and the new covenant I want to go back to an example in the old covenant about Uzziah in, uh, reigning in Judah. And this is in Second Chronicles 26, 1 through 5. We're going to read this, and I want to talk a little bit about what happened in the Old Covenant. And all of this was before there was the sacrifice of Jesus. And it said in verse 1, Now all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father, Amaziah. And he built... Elath and restored it to Judah. And after the king rested with his fathers, Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jecolia in of Jerusalem, and he did. Now this is this is a this is something. He says, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father. Uh, Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. Now, this is very important, this next part. It said, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. That's right. That's key. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Yes. But let me show you what happened to him. If you go to verse 16... It said, but when he was strong, when he, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up and he began to get a little prideful. And to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord, his God, by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of the incense. Now listen, it was very important for you to understand that in the old covenant, you were either a king or you were a priest. You could not be both. You could only be, and see, the Lord, it wasn't really his plan for there to be kings, but the people cried out wanting a king. Yes. So God began to give them kings. But they weren't perfect. There was only one perfect king, and that was Jesus. And so until Jesus came along, everything had a flaw. And especially when these people begin to operate in their flesh. So he went against what the Lord had instructed. And he tried to do what only the priests were supposed to do. All right, so let's go back to this. It said, for his transgress he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests. Now, I guess they thought they needed to get a, a little bit of support there. So he didn't want to go in on his own, so he got 80 of them, and they all went in together of the Lord. Uh, these were violent, uh, uh, valiant, probably violent too. By the time. These were vi valiant men. And it said, and they withstood King Uzziah. See, he just got prideful. He thought, well, I've got the favor of God. I can do anything I want to do. No, you can't. Not in that day. You had to follow the laws of the land because they were still under the law back then. So uh, let me go back to, let's see. Uh, lost my place. So in verse 17, so Azariah and the priests went after him and he took 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men with him, and they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, this is the reason why, who are consecrated to burn incense. They were anointed to do so. They were consecrated to do so. Now, they couldn't, do, they couldn't do the decrees of a king. They had to do what was their part. So everybody had to, that was the law. These were the laws that were created in that time. So they looked at him and they said, get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God anymore. See, what he did, 
is he went against what he knew to be what was the plan for his life. He went against it. He thought, well, I can just do anything I want to. No, he couldn't. And it said, then Uzziah became furious and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead. He opened himself up to a curse because he did against the plan of God in that day. Jesus was the only perfect king and sacrifice. He was the only perfect priest and king. It was Jesus. And it's important that you understand that and understand the difference in the old covenant and what was brought forth in the new covenant. And it goes on to say, in verse 21, King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death because he went against what he was supposed to do. Y'all, that was the old covenant. Now let's talk about the new. Are you ready? Yeah. Hallelujah. So in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it said, but you, that's every one of you, and we, all of us, we are a chosen generation. A, look at this, royal priesthood. Both a royal priesthood. King and priest. King and priest. Royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people that you might proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. A big difference in the old covenant and the new covenant. See, being a royal priest, being a royal priesthood gives you the authority as king and the anointing as priest. You have the anointing and the authority. Yes. Both. We operate in both. We get both. Why? Because it's no longer we are living, but it's Jesus, the perfect lamb sacrifice, the perfect one who was stainless. He had no fault and no flaw, and yet he took all of our old nature and he put it away so that now we can operate in authority. Where he said, I give you the power in Luke 10, 19, and the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions where nothing by any means shall harm you. That means nothing. No sickness, no disease, no cancer, no heart disease, no nothing can harm you. He's given you the authority and the power and the anointing to stand against everything that Satan would try to bring against you. That's why this is so important that you understand how the old covenant was and the limitations that they had because Jesus had not yet gone to the cross. And now we have everything given to us. Everything. So you can operate in that. You don't have to say, well, God put this on me to teach me a lesson. No, he did not. He does not do that. He does not put sickness on you. He does not put poverty on you. He does not put destruction on you. He does not make you bitter and, 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 and weary. And He doesn't do these things. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. And that's what he's blessed you with. He's given you the authority. He's given you the anointing. Both. You have both. This is so important that you understand this. And, and it says in, um, you know, in... Revelations 12, 11, it says, and they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. As kings, we decree the word of God. We decree the word of God and as priests, we apply the blood sacrifice of Jesus. Amen. And once we do that, then we literally can be victorious in every area of our life. Hallelujah. I want y'all to get this. We no longer in the old covenant. We are in the dispensation of grace. Amen. Glory to God. And from now to the time that Jesus comes, there will be no more law. There will be no more. Jesus fulfilled the law. He didn't do away with it. He fulfilled the law. The law was brought forth to show us the need for a Savior. And now it's no longer about us or what we had to be back then. Now we just say, Lord, I lay down my old man. I raise up in Jesus and I am more than a conqueror. I am a king and a priest. I have the authority and the anointing. Yeah. See, in the, 
Yes, the blood covenant. That's right. And see, in the old in the old covenant, they did, weren't filled with the anointing. The anointing would come and go. It would sit upon them. But it abides in us. It abides in us. We are kings and priests. Do you understand the value? Some of you may not have even realized or understood the value of being a royal priesthood. But that's something we really wanted you to grab a hold of. It's so very important. Unlike, <clears throat> excuse me. Unlike anybody else, Jesus serves as both king and priest after the order of Melchizedek who, like Jesus, was both king and priest. Let's look over at Hebrews here for a moment here. Hebrews 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Jesus is a king and a priest continually after the order of Melchizedek. We are kings and priests forever because Jesus resides in us. Amen. In him we live, like Regina said, in him we live and move and have our very being. So our mindset needs to be, we need to be thinking like kings, thinking like priests, seeing ourselves like that, not to rule over people, not to, to lord over people, but to rule and reign in this life through Christ Jesus. As born again, Holy Ghost filled believers, knowing who we are and having a mindset of the power and authority that resides inside of us. Not laying down and playing dead when the enemy goes boo or when some situation comes your way and it looks like, oh man, I'm about to lose everything. Looks like my whole world's getting ready to collapse around me. No, in the name of Jesus. I am a, both a king and a priest. I am joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He happens to be my elder brother and he's the son of God. So I am just connected in so many ways. You are connected in so many ways. And this is not about bragging rights. This is about operating in the authority and the power and in the blessings that God has bestowed on those who have called upon his name and accepted the free gift of his son, Jesus Christ, who was slain from the foundations of the earth. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, baby. All right, Romans 5, verse 17. Romans 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense, all right, the one man's offense, who is it? Adam. If by one man's offense, death reigned through this one, much more. Everybody say much more. Much more. I mean, we got overkill here. We're talking about just excess. Much more. Those who receive the abundance of grace. What kind of grace? Abundance. Not a little grace, a little dabble do you kind of grace. I mean abundance of grace. Receiving the abundance of grace and of the gift of what? Righteousness, right standing with God. Will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. I'm going to read it again in its, in, uh, in its entirety. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through this one, much, much much, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. For he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness 
of God in Christ Jesus. So the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Christ Jesus. Right, just that, those three verses right there, 17 through 21, just right there in Romans 5, is your authority and your license to rule and reign in this life. You've got a lot of supporting scripture that go along with that all over the New Testament. But just Romans 5, 17 through 21 is a declaration. You could make up a little card and put it in your wallet to remind yourself. And when some policeman stops you, somebody saying, I'm ruling and reigning in life through the one Christ Jesus. So what can I help you with, officer? <laughs> Gotta know who you are in Christ. See, the problem is we may hit and miss on who we are in Christ and, our, and, and the things that belong to us, but it's imperative that we have not just a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge of who we are. Because if it's in the heart, when the pressure, we'd be like a sponge. When the pressure comes of life, what's going to eke out of us is kingship and, and ruling and reigning and priestship is going to eke out of us. Because that's who we are. Ruling and reigning in life. Amen? Amen. You know, in John, y'all know this scripture in John 4, 17, it says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because, and say it with me, as he is, so are we in this world. Amen. Say it again. As, as he, he is, is so, so are we, we in this world. In the, well, in the sweet by and by? No, right now. Oh. And then. Oh, and then too? Yeah. Now, now and then? Now and then. Oh boy, oh boy. Now and then. Yeah, that's There's good. There's candy like that, isn't it? Huh? Isn't there candy called now and then? Now and oh, now and later. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> it's still sweet. <laughs> but anyway, this is good news. This is, this is good. Are, do y'all like this? Are y'all having fun with us? We're having, we're having fun. But anyway, so this, this is good news because y'all, you don't have to wait until you die and go to heaven to live on streets of glory. You can have glory right now. You can have glory right now. You can have victory right now. You can have health right now. You can have prosperity right now. You can have it all right now because as he is, so are we in this world. And he had everything. And he gave everything to us. Now we have everything. So you know what? Then why you go around pouting? You know what? We have it. We have everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. We already have it. Yeah. And when we recognize who we are in him, then we can do what it says in, in uh, Philemon 1, 6, where it says that the sharing of your faith, then you'll share your faith, and that it will become effective by the acknowledging of what? Every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Everything that is in you. Yeah. Then you will be sharing your faith, and people will see it, and they will know, man, you got something I want. If they're not asking you about what you have and what's in your benefits package and why are you so happy and why are you so full of joy, then you need to reevaluate a few things in your life. You need to go back and do a study on who you are in Christ. It's so important that you understand this. You are not defeated. If you're walking around defeated, why? Why? When he's already given you the authority and the power and the anointing to stand against every weapon that would be formed against you, it won't prosper unless you let it. You have the authority to stop it. You have the authority to walk in victory. You have the authority to, to have a wonderful family. You have the authority and the power and the love of God to have a wonderful marriage. You have it. It's in you. Recognize what he has given you. Recognize who you are in Jesus Christ. You know what you can do? You can actually, with your family, you can do a study, write these scriptures down, put them all over the house. I am more than a conqueror in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Stick it everywhere. Put it everywhere. Teach it to your children. The Bible talks about putting it on your doorpost. Put it everywhere. Stick it everywhere. The Bible talks about that. It's time for us to operate in Christ. Amen. It is time for us to operate and know who we are in Christ. How many of you are ready to do this? Yeah. Let me say this too on the same verse in Philemon 1.6. That the sharing of your faith may become effective. Meaning wherever you share your faith, wherever you communicate who you are in Christ. I mean, when you communicate the gospel out of your own heart, you want it to be effective. You want it to, to, to bring results in people's lives. But it's, it says by the, I want you to just tell me if this is correct. Is it by the acknowledgement of every good thing in you? Is that correct? No, it's not correct. It's not, it's not going to become effective by acknowledging every good thing in you. Why, why is that not correct? Because the word says, in your flesh dwells no good thing. Good. So if it stops right there or you stop right there, you're saying my faith will become effective by acknowledging every good thing in me. By or everything in me. And that's not what it says. It says by everything in us in Christ Jesus. Not in our flesh. Because you cannot get past that scripture that says in my flesh. There not, dwells no good thing. But in me, in Christ Jesus, is every good thing. And I'm acknowledging it. But I'm not acknowledging it unless it's in Christ Jesus, in me. Amen? Amen. This is good news, isn't it? Yes. Amen. And you know what, y'all? It really is that simple. Religion has made things difficult and wrong. It was the religious people that crucified Christ. I'm telling you, Jesus is in you. Operate through him yes. from now on. And recognize when you step out from abiding in him and stay back. Get, you know, do some reevaluating. If you're depressed, then you're not abiding in Jesus. If you're sick, you're not abiding in Jesus. If you're, you know, and, and I'm saying now, I'm telling you, if sickness has tried to come on you and you have been having sickness in your body, you just tell it it doesn't have a right to be there and you are well in Jesus' name. Faith is calling those things that are not as though they are. He already paid the price. You know he's what? already done all he's You're going to do. You're acknowledging every good thing in you when you say in sickness does not dwell in me in Christ Jesus. That's exactly right. So when you operate in the things we were saying today, and again, I urge you, go with your families, even your small children, you know, unless we become like a little child. The Bible talks about that. Go and teach them this. Have Bible studies in your home. Spend time as husband and wife praying together, reading and studying the word together. Get in there and find out there is so much more. We barely scratched the surface today of what we had time to do. But the most important thing we wanted to talk about was this understanding that you are a royal priesthood. You have the authority and the anointing to live this out. And Amen. And to rule and reign in Woo. Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. In this life. Amen. Did y'all enjoy that? Amen. All right, All right. Stand up with us if you would. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you right now. We thank you, Lord God, that we have an understanding of who we are in Jesus Christ and that we are kings and priests, a royal priesthood. And Lord, that we will abide in you and let your words abide in us. And we know that we will be, we will prosper and everything that we put our hands to shall prosper. We give you praise and glory and honor in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never exchanged your old sin nature for the nature of God, the nature of righteousness, if you haven't done that, you haven't been born again, then you need to be born again. The Bible says you must be born again. There's no way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. It's a narrow way. 
That's what the word says. But it's narrow because it has to be through Jesus. That is the only way. And if you've never accepted Jesus, please come down here. You've never invited him to be your Lord and your Savior. Our prayer ministers are down here and they'll be glad to, to pray with you to receive Jesus at the same time. If you have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you really need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's where the power comes in, the power to operate. Yes, you are saved if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but you're not operating in the fullness of his power. And you need that. You need that to be as, as part of your arsenal to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking of the tongues. The Lord will begin to show you things by the Spirit, show you things to come. You'll, the Word says you'll be able to give thanks well. It'll stir up the love of God that's already been shed abroad in your hearts. There's so much value in, in being baptized in the Holy Spirit and with speaking in other tongues, but praying in other tongues. Andrew Womack makes this statement, and it's so true. He said, you know, he's had his ministries just finished this year is 50 years, or 2018 was 50 years. And he said he spent so much time praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues. And he said, if I hadn't spent that kind of time praying in tongues over the 50 years, he said, you would have never heard of me. And that's true. And so that showed that's a great value. Paul, the apostle, talked about praying in the Spirit. He said, I pray in the Spirit more than you all. It's very important. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, please come down here also and let our prayer ministers minister to you and anything else that you want prayer over, anything else that you want a prayer of agreement, whether it's uh, family matters or whether it's uh, uh, finances or, or health or anything else.